enemy. Welcome back to another episode of the Hardcore Casual with your boy, Base the Kid. As always, please like and subscribe, share with a friend, a colleague, a relative, an associate, an enemy, any and all in between. It is appreciated. Now, apologies, I was supposed to do this video yesterday and then I was even supposed to get it out first thing this morning. But when I tell you I have been exhausted over the last couple of days, I needed just a little bit of time to recharge. Plus, I gave you some content on Tuesday with Base Talks. It's going to be more content today and tomorrow. Plus, there's probably going to be some content on Saturday as well. And you know that the weekend gets wrapped up on Sunday, even though the boxing don't finish until Wednesday next week. But you know what? We go through, we do what we do, and we just make it happen. With that being said, what I want to do with this video, there's been several big talking points, but rather than um, have a video that's about 30, 35 minutes long, I'm going to keep it very brief on the majority of them. I'm going to give you some uh, quick snippets of talk points here and there, and then maybe do an extended segment on one or two. So without further ado, let's get into it. So first things first, Monday. Now, first things on Monday, we heard noise that Alicia Baumgartner had been cleared by the WBC of any intentional wrongdoing with regards to her PED case. Um, they heard the case, they looked at her profile, they checked all of her um, details, evidence, everything, and they decided that um, while the test itself was credible, there was no uh, factor to determine whether or not you know it was intentionally ingested. So at this point in time, they have kept her as a WBC champion of their of their sanctioning body, but she is on probation until the 13th of July this year, and then also will have to take mandatory uh, random VADA testing at her own expense from now up until then and an additional six months after that. Uh, if she's caught within any violation within that period of time, they will, while they can't stop her from fighting themselves, what they will essentially do is strip her of the title and ban her from fighting for any WBC sanction bouts moving forward. Now, whether or not that actually means anything, I have no idea because, you know, they don't have the power to stop her from fighting in total. And ultimately, if she can't fight for the WBC, she could just fight for another belt if that's what she wants to do. But... I mean, I guess maybe some of the other sanctioning bodies would follow suit with that and say, no, nope, we're not going to, you know, if, if they stopped you from fighting for them, then we're not going to um, have you, you know, sully our name and fight for us as well. So with regards to that, look, it's um, this is information I found out a couple weeks ago. I was just waiting on the announcement. Um, also, while it hasn't been announced yet, I can maybe not necessarily say I was the first to break this, but I also know that Alicia Baumgartner is fighting, um, I believe she's fighting in it's either March or April time, and she will be facing Delphine Persoon in her return bout. It hasn't been announced yet, but that is the case. As you can see, if you're on her socials, you can see that she's been in the gym a lot more recently than she was before obviously she's always a gym rat but you've seen that she's posting live she's doing uh, lives on ig and all that sort of stuff skipping and everything doing her drills that's because she's getting herself into into position to announce the fight and i'm sure that press conference will be taking place some point within the next three to four weeks but yeah uh quick one on that uh, i'm happy that saga is over for that point the michigan unarmed combat uh commission still haven't um they, they still haven't said what they're going to do with it but i'm assuming as the wbc have made their ruling i'm sure the rest of the sanctioning bodies will probably follow suit now and then the mucc will probably just say the same thing afterwards but i would like them to hurry up and do their thing so that we can get clearance and clarity on that okay so from now on i'm just going to refer to it as twitex because i still going to be in the habit of saying Twitter and not X. It just doesn't sound right. So on Twitter X, you had Lennox Lewis basically, um, for lack of a better word, shitting all over the 
Anthony Joshua versus Francis in Garnu fight saying look it has it gives him zero credibility it doesn't uh, it shouldn't put him any closer towards a title shot because you know Francis in Garnu is an 0-1 fighter etc etc now I'm gonna go two parts on this number one I agree with um, Lennox Lewis in the sense that um, it doesn't particularly give him any additional credibility but as I've also stated because Joshua is not a champion and him taking that fight does not hold up the division or prevent anyone else from having their opportunities realistically um, I don't have any problems with it especially considering the fact that he went and fought uh, very frequently last year whereas a lot of other heavyweights didn't do the same thing so if you're active you deserve to be in position more than those who are just sort of sitting on the couch waiting for opportunities now with that being said outside of that both Lennox and Eddie Hearn went back and forth on it on uh, on Twitter for the entire day um, Eddie basically saying look the plan has been made by His Excellency Turkey Al El Sheikh. Uh, the winners of these fights are going to fight each other for the undisputed. He's going to go into a very big fight afterwards. Why are you complaining about it? Like you should just be happy for him and happy for boxing. Then you've got Lennox basically saying, "Well, look, how can you get prepared for the greatest fight of 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 your life and for the undisputed fight, fighting someone that you know has very very limited boxing ability and boxing experience." but then sort of going back and forth going back and forth eddie's just basically said look like can't you just be happy for the guy for once and in that ins in that instance i have to admit i do partially agree because it it's very clear that there's been a friction and a bad blood between both Lennox and Anthony Joshua for years. Now, the bad blood is probably more on Anthony Joshua's side because he doesn't like the way that he feels Lennox Lewis has disrespected him. A lot of people think uh, that could be because uh, Lennox Lewis never really got the same kind of love and fanfare over here that Joshua got, especially while he was boxing. Um, he did get a lot of those plaudits when he retired, but in this instance, like sometimes you want it in the moment, you want your accolades then and there, and maybe he didn't get the same love and attention and the opportunities and the money that AJ is generating there's that plus also he did try to sign AJ straight out of the amateurs and AJ ended up going with Eddie Hearn and Matchroom instead so you say that might be the issue uh, some other people think that the friction between them started when um Lennox Lewis believed that AJ was ducking the Deontay Wilder fight by you know only offering him five times his highest purse and then six times his highest purse then six and a half times his highest purse with a, I think it was a 40% uh, guarantee of the US the US money when Wilder wanted 40% of the total revenue or something along those lines plus whatever offer and basically from that moment it just seemed like Lennox Lewis was overly critical of every and anything that Anthony Joshua had done Anthony Joshua obviously went on Sky Sports and said he don't rate he don't rate and respect Lennox Lewis Lennox Lewis is a clown and it just basically went back and forth from there now look both guys said things in the past that probably wasn't necessary you had Lennox also criticizing um Rob McCracken from early to be fair he was one of the first people that did and ultimately I guess what he said came true because Joshua did end up leaving him but yeah it was just every moment is constantly critical 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 and the way we look at this one ultimately you see Lennox Lewis now he's criticizing this one he said that oh well yeah well Joshua won the volume fight the volume fight but he was supposed to like you know Valine didn't even really like he trained there was no abs he didn't he didn't even look in shape kind of thing but you know Tyson Fury against Francis Ngannou all of a sudden he gave loads of excuses for Tyson oh he just he wasn't in the right shape of mind but he done what a champion does by just gritting it out it would be it shouldn't have been that tough for him you know you look at his body you clearly probably didn't train his hardest but there was no criticisms to Tyson Fury fighting Francis Ngannou when he was a WBC lineal champion 10 months out of the ring hadn't fought hadn't given any other fighters an opportunity to fight but all of a sudden you're, you haven't made many, any mention of this up until after the fact the fight has happened itself so a lot of people say you know 
the criticisms, he doesn't levy criticisms towards Deontay Wilder, doesn't levy criticisms towards Tyson Fury or other boxers, um, especially the uh, you know the other British ones. But every moment something Anthony Joshua does, he has a comment or a criticism to make. Some of them might be fair critiques, some of them might be um, constructive criticism, and some look like they're just taking pops and just having a go for the sake of having a go. Either way. Um, that's basically how that is running back and forth. It's not really great to see. Um, I do think that at some point, the two of them need to come together, have a conversation and make peace with each other. But ultimately, I have to attribute the majority of this to Lennox at this point. At the end of the day, he's a grown man. Like, yeah, there's a certain school where you should be allowed to have your say, but you he must know at this point that he is just being overly petty and critical towards Anthony Joshua. Maybe leave leave the guy alone in it. Like stop talking about him now. Unless you're specifically asked a question, like maybe don't give your opinions on him for a period of time. Because clearly your opinions and the way you deliver them is not to his liking. Now look, I, I understand the way I, the way you say something it shouldn't you shouldn't necessarily care how someone else receives it but if that's the case then you also shouldn't be upset at the backlash that comes back at it so i would just chill on the both of them chill on talking on each other for the time being leave it as that um and then hopefully in the future maybe once joshua's uh, retired they can come together and mend the broken fences especially considering that joshua likes to call himself an honorary jamaican as well so you, you maybe you want to you, you want to <laughs> bridge that gap there just a food for thought let me know what you guys think so this next part i'm going to try and amalgamate the entire thing in one section because it all basically um surrounds you know Saudi Arabia, Riyadh season, and for some parts, even outside of Riyadh season. So on Monday, as you guys know, I was at the Knockout Chaos press conference for Anthony Joshua versus Francis Ngannou. In that press conference, there were several announcements and several plans and ideas that were made. So let's run through those first of all, and then we'll kind of give some overall thoughts. So the very first announcement that was made was the undercard of Francis Ngannou and Anthony Joshua. The co-main event is Jean Gelais versus Joseph Parker. Um, the third from bottom is actually Ray Vargas versus Nick Ball. And then outside of that, you've got Justice Hooney's gonna be on that card. Uh, I believe Moses Atalma is also gonna be on that card. Um, I think David Nika as well is on that card, although he might be on the, the February one, not quite sure. So you've got that undercard there. Then the undercard for uh, Fury versus Usyk was also announced with the chief support co-main event being Jayo Pattaya versus Maris Bredas. I'm not going to get into the farcical nature of, you know, what happened with the IBF and the fact that they stripped him for not allowing him to take the, um, you know, the fight against Ellis Zorro. So rather than just not sanctioning the bout as a, you know, as a sanctioned IBF bout, they made him have to give up the belt to take the fight only for him to then fight back for the fight, fight back for that same belt in his very next fight. Farcical, stupid. And funny enough, I even spoke to, um, I spoke to Mick Francis, um, Jai Opatia's manager, uh, about a month ago, maybe a month and a half, um, and I actually asked him, "Is there any chance that ultimately you can you have you can give up the belt, but then as soon as you know you come through this Elizora fight, you can just fight again for the vacant title?" And he said, "I don't think it's gonna work that way, or I don't think it's gonna be possible." Obviously, at that point, there was Zerdo Ramirez in the rankings also, but. With Zerdo going the opposite way and going with Arsene Gulamarian, now all of a sudden the same thing that I suggested to Mick Francis is actually happening. So, hey, um, I guess a bit of that 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 what they call me Bastradamus at times. And, you know, sometimes I sometimes I get those I get those picks, predictions, and scenarios right. Um, but yeah, he's going to be facing Bradis on that card, and then we've also got on that card um, Joe Cordino versus Anthony Kakache. Uh, I think Zizou Al Mayouf is also on that card, um, and I'm not sure who else. I, I can't remember the rest of the fights off the top of my head. Oh, um, Mark Chamberlain and Gavin Gwynn is also on that card. That's that's gonna be a, a pretty good fight. Now, 
I was thinking which card was better. A lot of people think that the, the Fury Usyk card is the better card of the two. Actually no, sorry. Mark Chamberlain and Gavin Gwynn, I think that's on the AJ card. Um, I actually think the AJ card is a little bit better because obviously Jai Opatai and Miles Bray is a tremendous fight, you know, proper world level fight and it's Jai's first world level fight since the last Braders fight but that being said Braders ain't been in the ring for like a year and a half at this point he hasn't had any warm-ups any tune-ups so Jai who's been grinding and has just had two basically warm-up keep busy fights within the last year um you know he should really be super advantageous in this one Joe Cordina even though he's maybe uh you know fighting against time at 130 I think personally, level wise, he is leagues above Kakache, but it's a good, you know, I guess it's a good uh, challenge for him and it's a big money fight. On the other side, when you've got Zhang Jale and Joseph Parker, both of those are fighters that have fought fairly recently within the last five months. It will be less than six months by the time those two fights happen um, for both guys. And then you've also got. Um, Ray Vargas and Nick Ball. Now, obviously, Ray Vargas hasn't been in the ring since March last year, so he's been out a year, but that is a very competitive and a very intriguing fight. Um, and then again, Mark Chamberlain, Gavin Gwynn, I also think that's a that's a fantastic little, you know, says domestic fight on a, on a global scale. So it, overall, I like both of the cards. Um, Turkey, His Excellency Turkey Ali Sheikh also put out his own undisputed title. Uh, which will be um, given, I guess, to the winners of both Fury Usyk and Joshua Ngannou if the two sides get to meet at the end of the year or after, I guess, the rematch clause for Fury Usyk. I'm not sure if they're going to give that title to the Fury Usyk winner first and then basically that title is what is contested for between the, um, them and obviously AJ Ngannou. But the belt itself, I mean... It looks okay, but it is a very gimmicky belt um, and it looks like, you know, I likened it to TNA Impact Wrestling's World Heavyweight Championship because that is kind of the style it looks it looks like. Um, they maybe would have done a bit better to model it more after a WWE belt um, or one of their designs. But yeah, it definitely looks very heavily TNA Impact Wrestling inspired. Uh, but that being said, I mean, look it looks like it costs quite a bit of money um definitely more than the other sanctioning body belts this one looks like it cost at least seventy thousand uh dollars to make um so yeah i mean look they got everything to play for um his excellency also announced on the night that he is looking to make um better be a bivol in about june he said he wants to respect arto better Beef's ramadan commitments and make sure that he's okay and he can train strong and train well after ramadan which ends i think on the 13th of april this year with that taking place i i believe that it will probably end up being towards the end of june maybe the start of july and then he's also said once that fight happens the winner of that undisputed bout, he wants to then move up to cruiserweight to face Jayo Patayo. Now, if that's Bivol, that's going to be a very fun, tactical, technical bout. Um, you know, Jai will look to land, but the pure boxer is normally the one that wins those type of exchanges. But with the added size and the, the similarity in speed, um, I think Jai would have a very, very... Uh, good chance of of winning that fight on the 12 you know from a 12 round perspective uh Bivol is just he's a small 175 or so to go up to to cruiser it would be uh would be interesting although Jai isn't the biggest of cruisers either so we wait and see however the fight that would actually be the most intriguing is Jai Opataya and Arta Betabiev um, because that is that's pretty much destructive that's destruction no matter what way you look at it you've got the boxer puncher versus the pressure fighter slash pressure in boxer puncher um both extremely good technicians both with very devastating power um and both with very very elite skill sets that you know will probably complement each other so 
while I've always maintained that Bivol wins that fight and I will look at it a bit closer towards and see if there's anything to make me give pause and decide to how I would um, how I would go about assessing it I have to admit I would much rather see better be and an open tile as opposed to Bivol and open tile as even though both matches to me would be fantastic um, Shout out to Ade Oladipo of the Zone. He also done a sit down interview with His Excellency Turkey Ali Sheikh, who now said that he has reached out to Al Heyman to see if he can get some of those Heyman fighters to come over to Saudi Arabia to fight. Now we've also we've seen already that um, Frank Sanchez has you know went over and fought in Saudi Arabia. He was uh, from PBC. Ray Vargas is now fighting on there who I believe also had an affiliation to PBC whether he was a full-fledged one or not I'm not sure um, you know the Saudis were the first ones to bring over Badu Jack who was heavily involved in sort of PBC and the TMT um, team so hopefully if that does happen then you can see the likes of, of people like Tank Davis and those guys going over, getting that bag and finally taking, you know, the fights that the fans want them to take. Um, I know he's also said he wants to speak with Devin Haney as well. I know Devin's been out there several times. He's looking to also get involved in that in that uh, mix. So it's yeah, it's looking real positive. It's looking like maybe while they may not be here to stay at the moment, they've got big plans. Um, there were some other bits and pieces that sort of did take place there but um, yeah I kind of want to leave it to those I'm really looking forward to um, you know to sort of Zhang Parker um, I'm looking forward to the Opataya Bredis rematch and I'm also really looking forward to Ray Vargas and Nick Ball that's all outside of the main events and then I'm looking forward to what's due to happen further down the line but yeah i'm gonna leave it there for now thank you good oh actually no i'm not gonna leave it there because i almost forgot we've got the big uh matchroom versus queensbury 5v5 potential tournament to happen towards the back end of this year as well so i'm assuming they will probably do that in the next Riyadh season as opposed to doing it in the summer or in the months outside of Riyadh season but you never know they might do that one there as well um leave your comments down below let me know the kind of fights that you'd like to see on that card me personally um i mean look there are a lot of people are talking about callum smith versus anthony yard and i can see why there's a good narrative there and that would actually be a very good main event for the card um personally i would rather see after a tune-up fight or maybe two if there's enough time for two craig richards versus anthony yard because obviously you know it's that it's that battle of london against south london versus east london it don't get better than than a good old london rivalry in the light heavyweight division so you've got that one i'd also like to see justice hooney versus moses atalma um both of them are similar i think moses is seven and oh at the minute or six and oh but he's more active at the minute than uh then no i think he is seven and over five ko's um and then you've got justice who is eight and over four ko's but both are you know got good amateur backgrounds justice is more accomplished as an amateur but you know moses is is uh rising heavily i would also love to see ray ford against nick ball uh, especially if they both come through their world title fights next i think that would be a brilliant fight and it would be a good unification for the card um i'd also like to see um dalton smith versus pierce o'leary i think that would be a great fight for the card um now i all what i wanted was sky nicholson and raven chapman if you can get the women on on the card but i don't know what the politics will be whether or not that would be that would be a possibility if not then the other fight that i would like to see is um austin amor williams against denzel bentley now i know obviously denzel's got to get himself back in the winner's bracket and that would be probably the only fight whereby it's an unbeaten guy against a guy with losses um but you know i know some people have said oh it should be hamza shiraz or um or uh um who else have they said yeah a lot of people said Hamza Shiraz because they're about the similar levels or even possibly Nathan Heaney um, but I just think Williams and Bentley is just that's just a car crash waiting to happen and I think that fight itself lends itself better to that um, also as a wild card option um, if you want to do Callum Smith and Anthony Yard I think Zach Parker is moving up to 175 from 168 so you could have 
Craig Richards against Zach Parker. And if um, Zach Parker actually wants to go back down to 160, uh, 168, then maybe you could have him against Edgar Belanga or Diego Pacheco. Um, or maybe even you do the John Ryder rematch, seeing as he quote unquote broke his hand in the first one. Who knows? Um, there's just some options that I've got on my mind. Leave yours down below. Let me know what you think. I've probably now made this video way longer than I wanted it to be. Apologies, but I get like that sometimes. Leave it all down below. Let me know what you think. Like, subscribe and share. Thank you very much for everyone who has tuned in. That's the Hardcore Casual out.